Good morning, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome at this rather earlier hour than we normally do uh, at the Institute. Um, we're here to talk about the, uh, <coughs> last, night's, last night's results. And um, could I ask you to put your phones on silent? Um, the proceedings are on the record, by the way. There's no. Um, and when we get to the questions and answers, if you identify who you are. And uh, so, so let's kick off. I'm delighted to say we have a, a really uh, distinguished panel this morning. On my um, uh, right here is Marion Harkin, who has been an independent MEP for the Midlands North West region since July 2004. Um, <laughs> uh, previously a member of the Oil Area. Um, she announced that she wouldn't be seeking re-election uh, for, for the European Parliament. Uh, she's a member of the ALDE group and was a member of the European Parliament's Committee on Employment and Social Affairs from 2009. Uh, Lucinda Creighton is a CEO and founder of Vulcan Consulting, um, which advises people in all aspects of EU policy. She was previously Minister of State for European Affairs from 2011 to 2013 and was a TD for Dublin South East from 2007 to 2016. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel Sean Quinlevin is a lecturer in European Political Science in the Department of Government in UCC. Uh, she was born in France, graduated in European Law and Political Science from La Sorbonne, Science Po and Edinburgh University. So we're, uh, we have lots of expertise here, so I, I just kick off and ask everybody, what's your general reaction to what happened last night. <laughs> Emmanuel, do you like to kick off? Will I start? Um, right, well, um, I, usually European elections are relatively dull, I think, and this one was quite an exciting one. Obviously, the uh, high level of participation was, I think, a surprise for everyone. Um, certainly, you know, I'm following more closely Ireland and France, obviously. Um, and France, um, what was expected was a participation of 42% and we're over 50%. Oh, overall, uh, across the EU, as you well know, we're at the highest level of participation in the last 20 years, which is uh, fantastic. Now, no, not, let's not get carried away. We're still only at 50% of participation. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the, this election has showed, obviously, as a result that there's a high level of fragmentation in the European Parliament. For the first time, we don't have the monopoly of the SND, SND and the EPP. Um, and that's really interesting. And I think it also indicates a kind of development of an embryonic um, European political space where uh, citizens have engaged. We, we thought citizens were fed up with politics and had no interest in um, European elections, which are usually regarded as second order elections. Um, and it was interesting because um, yesterday um, the LSE um, published an article by Derek Beach, um, who analysed the uh, European elections in Denmark from 2014. And his analysis showed that two things if you have education of citizens on European issues, and if you have media coverage of transnational issues, of European issues, then citizens engage on European issues. Um, and maybe yesterday shows this kind of little fluttering of citizens engaging with European issues through this green surge. We haven't had the populist surge. Um, the populists are at 22%. I mean, uh, Professor Kassnuder, who studies extreme right-wing parties and populism, nationalism, keep saying there's no surge of populists like it. Across the EU, there are 20%, there are coalition partners at best, or they're the, in the opposition, but there's no, you know, despite all the fears of Marine Le Pen uh, winning the presidential election last time, mathematically it was impossible. The same way mathematically this time it was impossible for the populists to win a majority in the European Parliament. So I think there was media hype over, um, a surge of the populist. Uh, the green wave wasn't anticipated, but obviously we had uh, the Greens culturally won the cultural battle here with uh, Greta Thunberg, with uh, um, Extinction Rebellion, with different movements like that, um, that in the last 12 months have set the agenda. Um, and the curse of the Greens, though, is that 
uh, and I've seen it in France far too often, is that um, their um, manifestos or their programmes are cannibalised by other uh, parties that then green their own uh, uh, programmes. It was interesting yesterday when you were listening to um, uh, Lambert's uh, from the Green Party, uh, the European Green Party, saying, no, no, European citizens prefer the original to the copy. Uh, let's see. Um, but yes, I, I think the, 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 um, there's a, maybe a, an indication that uh, European citizens um, are mobilising, and obviously uh, your uh, environment is an ideal <coughs> par excellence, it's a European issue. So, um, you know, we've moved away from the economic crisis, the, the agenda is now on uh, climate change, climate protection, and um, the, the Greens have therefore done uh, ex extremely well. Well, as we were discussing earlier, uh, you have green deserts nonetheless in those elections, right? So Northern and Western Europe have voted for the Greens, but the Eastern Southern Europe haven't. Um, so that's, um, that, that's also something uh, to note. Uh, ultimately, I think the kingmakers will be Aldi and or the Greens. Um, or, or the Greens, depending on the configurations, but I think we'll discuss then of the possible configurations of what a majority would look like. Um, but my big positive point is that citizens, citizens have engaged. I think the fragmentation is good, actually. It was interesting to hear uh, Margaret Festager, who's obviously in the business of breaking monopolies, <laughs> um, being very delighted with the result yesterday. Um, and, um, and obviously Aldi with uh, the En Marche troops joining the Aldi group and I think calling themselves okay. Renaissance now um, are, will be the, the group to watch. Okay, Lucinda, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a, a very good summary. Um, I think from maybe from a, a, an Irish point of view, I would start by saying um, how much I appreciate Marion Hartman's contribution um, as an MEP. Um, a really excellent MEP on behalf of Ireland and the, 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 the North West for, for the last 15 years um, and you will be a huge loss so um, I want to say that as, um, as we start to talk about the wider issues. Um, um, I think a number of things, I mean certainly the, the, the sort of the extreme left and right populist um, Eurosceptic movement is not as dramatic as, um, as was anticipated um, and that's partly um, because of trends which we can sort of talk through in, 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 um, and, and they are somewhat different in different member states and different countries um, but I think probably you know there is always an interest from a, from a media perspective in um, exaggerating um, the rise of Euroscepticism and, and, uh, and populism so I think you know it was probably overstated um, for that reason too, um, obviously the green wave is has has arrived in Ireland, not to the extent that um, was suggested by um, exit polls um, on on Friday, but but still significant, um, significant here and significant in Germany, France, and a number of other countries, um, even the UK, um, where the Greens I think have outpolled um, the Conservative Party, which is quite a, an extraordinary outcome. Um, and obviously there are major implications from a Brexit point of view, which we can talk about a bit in, in a while. Um, I actually agree, though, with the, with the overall point which Emmanuel makes, which is that it's probably not a bad thing that the, um, the sort of carving up of um, the power base at European level, um, which for as long as I can recall has been dominated by the Social Democrats and um, the Christian Democrats, Conservatives, the, the S&D and the EPP. And I say that as somebody who is obviously, a, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a former Vice President of the EPP. Um, I've been very involved with the EPP for many years and I'm clearly a political supporter of the EPP. Um, but, I, but I actually don't believe that it's good for Europe that the EPP... Um, in the last five years, for example, I held the presidency of the Commission, the presidency of the Parliament, the presidency of the Council. Um, and I think it is important that there is a broader, uh, more reflective representation in the key positions in the, in the EU. Interestingly, and I think it will be of, of significant interest to a lot of people in this country, for the first time we're going to see 
a political appointment um, to, to, the, to the head of the European Central Bank. Um, so not only will you have the, the kind of three key institutional um, positions plus um, the, 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 for want of a better uh, word, foreign affairs um, uh, uh, leader, um, um, in other words, um, the head of the, the um, what's the title of the... Uh, 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 that's who I'm thinking of, but uh, um, the title. Or oh, she's uh, 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 the high representative. Yeah, yeah. high representative. Exactly, it's what become so irrelevant. I've, I've forgotten the I've forgotten the actual name of the role. Um, but but for the first time, you're also going to have the president of the European Central Bank included in that, which is a concern. I think um, I I don't think that the ECB president should be a part of these negotiations. But it's inevitable now that that will be the okay, case, yeah. and I think that that makes this interesting as well because it will be a big battle over that particular role from a German point of view, and that will have implications then in terms of the um, leadership of the other institutions. We, 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 come to, we come to that again, Marion. What do you think? Well, again, good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, I think we've had an excellent summary. I don't really want to go over the same round again uh, at one level. Can I see Aldi on 101 seats? I think, ah, why didn't you stay for another <laughs> five years? Because when I went there first, um, Aldi was the kingmaker for those five years to a large extent. However, we voted, made a difference in the parliament, less so the second time out and, and not really at all the last term. Um, of course, that swell in Aldi will be fuelled by the Lib Dems, so we're not quite sure how long they're going to stay either. But um, we certainly have a parliament with a different complexion. I agree with Lucinda, it's time that, as Pat Cox spoke of it last night, that duopoly is, is broken. And that, um, while he himself, I think, is perhaps the only person to break it by becoming president of the parliament, as a president of the Liberals. Um, other than that, it's been uh, either EPP or the Socialists. And the fact that they are now not just less than 50, but perhaps less than somewhere between 40 and 45. I don't have final uh, numbers of seats, well, we can't have yet, but it's, it's substantially less than before. So, as you'd say, it may be with Aldi, it may be with Aldi and Greens. I wouldn't be surprised, but that it, that will be the case. Interesting that, um, for now at least, even though you can't really be sure about groupings, and you can't also be sure about how cohesive and coherent they will be, especially six months down the line. But given where we are now, it looks like Salvini, who had hoped to be maybe in third place, is probably in fourth, if not maybe even fifth, because I think the Greens are just one ahead of them for now. So uh, a, a different parliament. I'm interested in what you said about citizens engaging. I, I would love to see the demographics of, you know, we went from 43 to 50. I'd love to see if we could see the demographics of who voted. Mm -hmm. um, if I had to guess, I would be inclined to think maybe more young people voted, or younger. Uh, everybody is young to me now. Uh, but that, that's what we see there. Though, of course, it, it won't be that clear cut. Uh, but equally, if you listen, for example, to Lynn Boylan last night, uh, when she was asked, what were people talking about on the doorsteps? Housing. So um, while citizens are engaging, having canvassed in four European elections and canvassed a bit this time with some independent councillors, um, you know, it's national issues by and large that come up on, on the doorsteps. So um, the other thing I suppose uh, I would say is that um, you were talking about the Greens and, and cannibalising their policy. Um, I think if you look at Ireland, that the exit polls has, have overestimated green support. We see that now with Kieran Cuff. I think Saoirse McHugh will do very well. I think she will struggle, though, to, to take that fourth seat. But it's, it's still not absolutely sure, but, but from looking at tallies, 
and especially we did some tallies of number twos yesterday. Um, I think she, she will struggle to uh, get elected. And, you know, we forget maybe that at one time we had two Greens here. Right, yeah. And I think this time we may just have one. I'm not sure that Grace O'Sullivan, she may, I haven't followed Munster, she may not, she may have to wait for a seat, if, if at all. Uh, so um, it's, it's not, uh, as I said last night, it's not a tsunami, it's, it's a wave and it's not everywhere. So finally, I suppose <coughs> the big jobs, um, who's going to... Um, we'll, 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 we'll come okay. to that, we'll come Fine. to that again. We'll come to that because that's, we, we've lots of time and because I think that's a really interesting... Uh, uh, we've now a fragmented parliament. What are the potential alliances? Say, you know, it's, it's not as easy Marion, having been knowing this parliament more, better than anybody else in the room, I guess, uh, how do you see it, uh, the various alliances? How is it going to work? Is it going to work? Um, well, I mean, they, they will have to make it work. Last time out, we had EPP and Socialists, but a lot of the time it didn't work, if you look how the parliament mm. voted, and especially as time went on. I mean, certainly 12 months out from an election, um, we saw the socialists move further to the left because they were trying to make up the ground that they knew they were going to lose. Um, and of course, they, they did lose in the elections. They were moving further and further towards GUI. It didn't really do them any good or GUI any good at the end of the day in the sense of trying to increase seats because they lost seats. But as to who will um, you know, work with whom, for example, in Aldi, we still don't know who will be leading the group. Uh, mm -hmm. There's every good reason to think it won't be Giva or Hushford. Um, so, uh, and I think the fact that um, Tusk is, is uh, in a preemptive move uh, to have a council meeting uh, to forestall what the parliament might do in the context of the, the big jobs is, is interesting as well. So. At the end of the day, what did they say about politics? It's the art of the possible, and it all comes down to numbers, and, and they will find ways of cooperating. The Greens, I'm not sure about. I remember in my first term there um, uh, that people would say time and time again, you cannot rely on them when it comes to, they'll negotiate, they'll negotiate, they'll almost agree, and then gone. I, I didn't find that the last time, but I'm not sure how it'll be this time. And who's going to lead the Greens? Do we know? Is it? Um, well, the... Uh, I, it's, Currently, it's they have, obviously, Philip Lambert and Philip Scott Keller. Lambert, yes. Yeah, he, and he, I mean, in fairness, I mean, I, I, I spoke to Philip Lambert about maybe six weeks ago, and... Uh, I had the distinct impression from him that the Greens are prepared to do business, mm -hmm. but on one condition, mm -hmm. that Manfred Weber will not be yeah. president of the I European Commission. Um, I don't think he will either. Mm -hmm. um, although there is still a strong belief in the EPP that he will be, but I think the trade-off um, will be we're connected we're to the ECB. Um, so a German president mm -hmm. of the ECB will make way for um, a different uh, leader of the Commission. Still, I expect EPP, but I think it's more likely to be uh, Michel Barnier. Um, and I, the, 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 certainly, I think the Greens will support Barnier, um, and they are prepared to support Barnier. I think he can be acceptable to Alde too, particularly if the French president supports him. Oh, yes. And his son cleverly was a candidate for the for the uh, Alde um, group, so or the, well, the broad alliance. I don't know how you yes. term the three different uh, elements to the kind of Alde arrangement but um uh so i can see something happening there but interesting um um uh, marion talking about you know about the council sort of trying to take the lead and organizing the informal dinner tomorrow night at the heads of state and government um but weber has actually arranged a meeting for the leaders of all of the um the kind of key uh, groups in the european parliament in advance of that so he's trying to move ahead and get the parliament to agree to sort of back the spitz and candidate uh, option, which theoretically is fine, except for the fact that nobody really wants him to be the spitz of candidate. <laughs> so um, I think that 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 causes a problem, you know. But you could see the parliament, for example, that the leaders of the main political groups not agreeing on a person or an individual, but saying, you know, uh, the, you know, as the Lisbon Treaty requires, that the outcome of the European elections 
will be reflected but without without specifying exactly what that means. Manuel, just getting legislation through, what do you think? Oh, can I just yes, say something? Yes, yes, um, yes. Just on the Spitzenkandidat, the European Par every European election, the European Parliament tries to flex its muscles and, and create institutional space and legitimacy mm. and etc. The Spitzenkandidat is pretty vital for them and I totally agree with Lucinda that you know, Weber yesterday in his speech during the live um, election um, speeches um, clearly said, like, you know, he, he announced his meeting with mm. all the other heads um, and he defended the Spitzen candidate um, kind of system, which obviously isn't stated out in the treaties. It's a political agreement, right? So we have a precedent. Um, and institutionally for the European Parliament, it's very important to defend that for your right then. Mm. Nobody wants really Weber to take that job. So there's a, there's a kind of small politics and big pol po political issue at the same time, or institutional issue. Um, but I think for the European Parliament, it's vital to, again, defend this uh, Spitzen candidat. So we'll see whether the small politicking takes over from the big institutional uh, issue. Um, I still think, uh, even though um, there are lots of different views, even academically on it, that the Spitzenkandidat is, a sm going back on the Spitzenkandidat is a step backwards in terms of linking people's vote to uh, <coughs> appointing the head of the, exec of the European executive. So if we return to heads of state and government deciding <coughs> on this, um, I just think it's kind of cutting off the link between our vote as citizens and the head of the, the executive. The argue, yeah. I thought the, the counter argument mm. to that, sorry, Rain, and, and I, I, I'm a big believer in the European Parliament and the importance and strength of the European Parliament, which has you know, dramatically increased in the last 10 years. But I mean, the Spitzenkandidat um, phenomenon, A, is not mandated by any of the treaties. It is a completely made up um, concept. Um, and it doesn't, I mean, there's a very strong argument to say it doesn't reflect, it's just, it's exact same as horse trading in the council. It just involves, a, you know, the other institutions. But actually, you know, there is no mandate. It's not a direct election. The people of, I mean, the voters, how many Irish voters <laughs> have had any idea who Manfred Weber <laughs> yeah. is? You know, they, 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 they actually know Barnier. Yeah. <laughs> and they put for down number reasons. one opposite Maria Walsh's exactly. name. Exactly. They weren't thinking about Manfred Weber, exactly. that's for sure. Exactly. But I agree. But that's an education issue then. I'm going back to my first point of Derek Beach, that Derek Beach make, makes in his article, that it's part of our job then to educate citizens on how institutions work, like largely or, or involving them in the process, in, which they're yeah, not currently. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with yeah. that. Yeah. And um, it's it's one of the things I certainly tried in my fifteen years mm. between uh, groups and schools and etc. But my experience, for what it's worth, is that people are interested in what interests themselves. So can I get, you know, can I? go into a room full of ordinary people and interest them in the Spitzing candidate, it is very difficult. But what you, what I have discovered, whether I'm right or wrong, is that if, if you have um, a group of people from the credit unions, you can very much interest them in the legislation that's going to impact on uh, you know, the financial legislation. The same with, well, we know it's true with farmers, but the same with different groups of people. But remember, um, a lot of people didn't even know who their MEPs were. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we don't have a list system. So, um, can you imagine in countries where there is a list system, it is extremely difficult. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, but it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think those of us in politics, either as a profession or, you know, those who study politics, probably most people in this room, um, we live in a bubble a lot of the time. Um, and um, we, we just forget sometimes that the people out there have to get on with their lives and that they're really, they're interested in something that impacts on them today or tomorrow. Climate change probably being the exception. Okay, uh, you, you, you talked a bit about the possible people who might fill these jobs. There are four jobs, I think, up for. We can't afford middle aged men. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other 
point. Like, is that, I, is I, that I a know, factor? Just tell me. It is absolutely a factor. Um, and not only in the top jobs, but I think there will be a huge drive in the European Commission to have as close to 50 50 um, gender balance amongst the, the 28, 27 commissioners. Um, and I would be surprised if we don't have, we we'll say, between the three institutional leaders um, plus the foreign policy lead. Oh, yes. um, I, I, I expect that it will be 50-50, so you will have, um, I, would, I would hazard a guess, we'll have a male president of the commission, but we could end up with a female president of the council, um, um, and, and a possibility of a female president in the European Parliament as well. Um, but let's see. I mean, it, it'll depend on the negotiations, obviously, between the parties, but I think there'll be a real effort to do that. And certainly within the commission, there'll be huge pressure, which could cause... Um, a challenge actually for the Taoiseach um, because everybody has an expectation about the appointment of the new European Commissioner um, but the only names in the reckoning are, are men again um, and we know from, from previous uh, discussions um, I, I'm not the last time but certainly um, the previous time when Fianna Fáil were in government there was, um, there was a, a, an absolute sort of um, non-negotiable negotiable demand um, by President Barroso that, that the Irish government would, would appoint a female commissioner and they did, Maura Gavin Quinn and she did a very good job incidentally um, we'll, I think there will be a lot of pressure and on of course one of the issues we'll face there just briefly on that is that Phil Hogan like him or know them yeah. is perceived to have uh, done a good yeah. job mm -hmm. as yeah. agriculture mm -hmm. commissioner and has really got stuck in and knows his brief and is respected yeah. um, in a way that not all recent commissioners have been. No, so and it's he's he's a very political character. Very served with him in government, so I can say that for better or for worse, he's he's deeply political, um, and and has um has made an impact mm, uh, undoubtedly yes. in Brussels, and is likely to be a vice president, which is a big priority for the Irish government, um, to have a vice president, um, um, which really matters now because it means you have access to the president and you really are a leader in the commission um, in, an, in an institutional way um, but there will be big pressure on the Irish government um, So I, I get a sense from you that nobody is rushing it out to Paddy Power to put money on Mr Weber is that? No but I would put money on Margaret Verstager who we yeah. haven't mentioned mm. um, woman yeah. Um, yeah. we're talking, I mean the vote yesterday obviously is the yeah. vote for the Greens but is a vote for a social Europe and a change in Europe and Weber and, and we heard uh, Timmermans Timmermans, well, all he said is Weber will be the same old Europe as usual. At least if we go with something else, you know, another, um, another head uh, will have change. So um, there, there was a bit of a pushback against the EPP yesterday. I felt really we could see a coalition between the, the kind of left of, of the spectrum, but they'll need all those uh, votes. But for Stagger, I think it's a dark horse. And I think, you know, she's, um, she fights for a protective Europe. She'd be acceptable to the Greens. She'd be acceptable to the SND. Um, and I Aldi would love her. Yeah, and Aldi would love her, obviously. And Aldi, by deciding, had a, I, I, I remember presenting it to my students, and I was like, I don't understand why Aldi is presenting this team of seven. Do you remember how mm -hmm. they don't, they yeah. didn't pick for Stagger, actually. No. They just, as their Spitzen candidate, oh, they yeah. presented a team. And it's what you were saying about all the jobs that are up for grabs with this idea of, yeah. We're basically presenting a team so that there's an option for every single job mm -hmm. um, that, that comes up. But for Saga yesterday clearly said, yes, I'm, I will be uh, the one, um, the candidate from Aldi to uh, go for the commission post. Um, so um, I would have my money on for Saga, quite honestly. Um, I think she'd be a fabulous president of the European Commission, first woman uh, head of the, uh, of the commission. Uh, on top of, we, we mentioned how German... The, uh, the European institutions could be. We have obviously also a sec gen of the Commission that's German. Mm -hmm. We have a sec gen of the of the European Parliament that's German. You know, we potentially have Weidmann, uh, ECB that um, um, could I mean is the lead candidate. Yeah. Uh, German. You know, um, when you when you I, I go and do interviews in Brussels, you, you hear very often 
yeah, like the European institutions have are dominated by Germans, and that's a problem with other nationalities, obviously. So we need very balance. Like it'll be very interesting to see how long the Secretary General of the Commission lasts. Well, that's <laughs> it. Like the way he was appointed. Well, yeah, well, I mean, well, if first Stagger becomes president uh, of the Commission, yeah. I'd say he'll he's gone. <laughs> he'll be promoted <laughs> elsewhere. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to throw it open. Anyone want to uh, want to get in or Francis? Yeah. Thank you, Ray. Uh, thank you very much for a very <coughs> insightful presentation, and I'd also like to echo what Lucinda said about Mary, the great MEP over the last 15 years. Oh, sorry. And you would know because you were. <laughs> but um, I, I agree with what you say about the Spitzenkandidat, the League candidates, but I do, and I know it's not mandated in the treaties, but it would be a big challenge for the Parliament if they decided to go against it, because the Parliament has invested, <coughs> right, <coughs> rightly or wrongly, so much in, in it. And um, I just wonder what, if they do go back, what kind of price the European Parliament might want to exact in offices elsewhere. <coughs> My other question is on uh, the, um, the right, because obviously the, the surge of the populist right wasn't nearly as great as predicted although they did very well, unfortunately, in places like Belgium mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Italy. They did very well and they kind of, they, they exterminated five stars. Mm -hmm. But what is going to happen now in terms of the right within the European Parliament, in your view? Obviously, Salvini wanted a big group of the right. I don't see that happening, but I'd like to know what you think will happen in terms of group composition on the right. Thanks. I, I, I think they'll be um, extraordinarily fragmented and I suppose we have to bear in mind that the very significant number of um, uh, pro-Brexit, Eurosceptic, right-wing MEPs in the UK will most likely be gone from the 1st of uh, November, so that will diminish the numbers as well. Um, but I mean, it's a feature on both the, the hard left and hard right. Um, we, we, saw, we saw it, not even the hard left, the moderate left, you could say, in, in Ireland, in the, in the European elections in Dublin, where they should have a seat in the European Parliament because Labour, Social Democrats, etc. can't work together, um, they likely will end up at no seat. Um, and it's the same problem with the far right in Europe, you know, so they have competing interests. Some of them are very pro Russian. If you move further east, they're completely anti Russian. Mm -hmm. Um, and Russia is a threat, even though they seem to have seem to have enormous influence from Russian propaganda and disinformation. Um, but they don't seem to make the link. Um, so, so very hard to see how they will all pull together. And we we saw it in the last Parliament and the previous Parliament. You know, they, they start out with the best of intentions, but they just can't get along. Yeah, but of course, pulling together in Parliament sometimes means just voting against everything. Well, exactly. And for somebody who. Uh, used to sit slap bang in the middle just the way it happened and two thirds of the way down you get a great view of what's <laughs> going on you know you see the uh, screen in front of you and the number of times that left and right and um, red is you know it's, it's incredible yeah. you need to be there to appreciate yeah. it yeah. people here wouldn't obviously so um Sometimes that's what works, but the, the, the nine or the no is not big enough, even with those two groupings. Mm. Uh, I haven't looked at the numbers, but because GUI didn't really mm. increase, yeah. um, the, the right will, but as you say, once the Brexit, well, if they leave, um, <laughs> you know, that will make a difference. And it's, it's to get agreement. <laughs> Talking about agreement, it's not your question, Francis, but I look at Aldi, uh, and I've been there for 15 years, and for the last five, I mean, even they're on, on social issues, when we dealt with things like posting of workers, for example, mm -hmm. um, and the only, the only way that was got through the parliament was that the rapper, we had co-rapporteurs mm -hmm. between the EPP and the socialists, and then there was agreement found. Yeah. But if either EPP or Socialists had tried to, to steer that through the Parliament, it wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. And Aldi, for example, was split on it. Not totally split, but it was. So when we now bring in on Marsh, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, 
I can see a few delegations in Alfie, mm. quite, um, let's say, economically liberal mm. delegations. And, you know, Vestager is one of those, mm. that they will struggle yeah. to some extent. So there'll be fragmentation. Uh, I think you won't see much of it in perhaps in the first year or whatever, but there, there was, if you were to look at voting records, uh, a bit of fragmentation, certainly within within Aldi. And when uh, when it comes to things like trade deals, etc., fragmentation within the socialists also. So uh, I think fragmentation within the groupings mm -hmm. last parliament uh, was more evident than for many years. So I don't see that trend reversing. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm just wondering if you maybe, maybe just just introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah hi, I'm uh, Chris Riskell from the Norwegian Embassy. I was just wondering if you could comment a bit about the uh, election in a sort of a local context. So what is it actually means for Ireland? So maybe talk a bit, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts of the impact of the votes that you've had on the local government, mm -hmm. but also if you see what European issues that are sort of the most prevalent in Ireland, even though you said national issues seem to take forefront in the election? Well, yeah, go ahead. No, not at all. I was going to say I'm not the person to answer that no, question. No, no. <laughs> you the we can all answer it. We're all voters <laughs> and whatever. Um, first of all, you asked about the issues that matter to people or, or what you hear from people. Um, they, they tend to be national. The, the only European issues uh, that you will hear about and it's not often. Well, obviously, agriculture for anybody who's, who's farming. Um, but beyond that, and that's not a huge group of people, though we, I think it is, but it's not. Um, beyond that, um, the, the very odd person might bring up about the European army, uh, because that was something that, that got a lot of traction. Um, but how many people ever ask me about social issues. I mean, I was astonished, I shouldn't be, but I was, that last term I mentioned the posting of workers. I mean, we go back to our treaties here, to, to Nice and to Lisbon. The big issue was race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. That was dealt with in the last parliament. I remember I, I actually wrote to the trade unions and tried to engage. I mean, did anybody at the end of all of this, was there a line? in a newspaper. I mean, there was some very significant social legislation put through last term. There wasn't a line in a newspaper about it. So how can people engage with European issues when there's nothing there for them? It's, it's a handful of MEPs going around talking to 15 and 16 year olds in schools and to organizations, as I said, whether they're carers or credit unions or farmers or uh, leader companies or, or whatever, that's the best way you can get in. So, you know, European issues, it's only what makes the headlines and one of the headlines was the European army. But the other question about national, uh, the, what I would say is um, there are no parallels or if you look at Midlands Northwest, let's say Fianna Falls collapse literally because they'll be around 10%, yeah. I think, maybe 11, maybe 9, um, which is shocking. But is that reflected uh, in the uh, local elections? Absolutely not. One has nothing to do with the other, uh, which is good news for Fianna Fáil, because it's, it's a real whipping from that perspective. So it's, it's the same people who voted mm. for... I think two Finnegan candidates in Midlands Northwest um, did not do so when it came to the local elections. So people can discern, and of course locals are different because people know their local candidates and that's, that's yeah. really important. But, so th there are no parallels. And it's interesting yeah. as well on that note that Eamon Ryan was very cautious about how his success in the European elections would transfer for a national election. Um, he, he knows, like Marion has highlighted, that they're just too different.
different types of elections. Yeah. And, you know, one doesn't transfer to the other, and it's not because you were successful in the European elections that you will be in the national elections. The Greens are possibly a bit unique because they did well in both elections. Um, I think I think the local elections, particularly because we're so close to a general election, the local elections are a very important bellwether in terms of what's coming. Um, so I, I would say from Fianna Fáil's point of view, they will be fairly happy actually with the outcome. They're emerging again as the largest party at local government level. Um, I think Fine Gael are very disappointed and obviously there's a lot of speculation in the media today but, and you know, the usual, I suppose, po post-mortem. Um, the Greens can be happy, Labour Party slightly happier than they were um, and Sinn Féin an absolutely mm -hmm. catastrophic day and, uh, and we're likely to see some fallout from that at European level as well. Um, so, you know, we, we will either have an election in September or we'll have an election in spring of next year. It's not far away. Um, and something pretty dramatic will need to happen for the main government party, I think, to, to try to, to gain ground and, and, um, and hope to be in a, a, you know, to benefit from a, I suppose, a, a tide or a wave um, 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 caused by the, the sort of the, 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 the new Taoiseach, etc., mm -hmm. relatively new. I think we can probably expect a reshuffle, even though he, he sort of ruled it out yesterday, but I think it'll, it'll ha kind of have to happen, especially if the election doesn't happen until next spring. Um, in terms of the European elections, I mean, Brexit, of course, is a factor, and I think that reflects in you know, people like um, uh, Mairead McGuinness doing very well. Um, I think she, you know, she, she, she did a lot of media um, uh, around Brexit, um, particularly, so did Brian Hayes, but obviously he wasn't a candidate. Um, and I think that that certainly has served her well, as well as the farming community, etc., etc. Um, so Brexit is, is probably a factor. Um, but um, but I do think that people have a sort of a liberty in in European elections. They yeah, they're, they they you know, it's a bit like the presidential election, um, in the sense that you might vote for a candidate, like our current incumbent president, like Michael D Higgins, and say you, you know you like him. He's kind of represents the country well abroad. He can deliver a good speech, etc. But you probably wouldn't vote for him, you know, uh, in a in a general election. Um, um, and I think that that you know that is probably slightly the case in the European election. Um, I thought this European election might be a bit different because of Brexit. I thought people, I thought Fianna Fáil would do better. Um, for example, because of the, your membership of the Alde group. I thought somebody like Brendan Smith. He's not the most dynamic candidate, but you know, a very competent uh, minister for agriculture with a decent profile. But that doesn't seem to have quite materialised, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the but voters. But Lucinda, uh, agriculture, three of the of four, uh, three of the MEPs seeking re-election are all on the agriculture yeah. committee yeah. in the parliament. Yeah. I mean, if you were to choose yeah. somebody to try and get a sector they could get votes mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. Brendan, though he is an extremely competent yeah. man, uh, was, the, was absolutely the wrong person because yeah. there is little doubt Maraid will have got one yeah, section absolutely. of the farmers and Ming and Matt and Ming more of them yeah. of, of you know of the other I yeah. just one point of that really interesting yesterday. I don't know if any of you have heard of her, but I've shared a platform with her, Pippa Hackish oh, yes. uh, from yeah. the Greens. Yes. She won a council seat mm -hmm. in Offaly. Mm -hmm. Now Offaly I've, I've canvassed there once, is as traditional <laughs> as it comes, you know, when it comes yes, to party politics. politics. But what did I spot? It was a Sinn Féin seat she took. She didn't take yeah. it off the parties. Yeah. So yeah. while the Greens you know, are doing well at European level and they are lifting council seats, yeah. how much that will translate, yeah. apart from Dublin and maybe Galway and maybe Kildare, because yeah. actually um, uh, uh, Saoirse McHugh mm. uh, did very well in Kildare. Yeah. But apart from that, I'm not sure how it No, but the, the Greens, well, you, the, the yeah. number on the local election, they're 5.6% of, of that's the vote. That's it. Yeah. Which is, that's 1 in 20, right? Yeah. You know? yeah. So now they could, maybe they could have run more candidates and all that stuff, but it's not... No, no. We no, should get carried away, it seems. Everybody was <laughs> carried away with them, um, yeah, for sure, yeah. Yes, sorry. Hi, um, Colin Bergen. Um, I'm just interested to hear what your take on it is the turnout for the well, the European elections and, and especially the, uh, the number of spoils. Yes. It's 4% in Dublin. I don't know what it is in the other constituencies, but that seems very, very high. Um, is that a general apathy about politics in general, Europe, or is it just something much more fundamental than that? 
Well, just very quickly on that, um, they say that there were quite a number of blank papers in um, Munster. But if you had a paper the length of it, you'd nearly fold it up yourself <laughs> and think, I'm not going to read down through that, etc. Um, and I think quite a lot of spoiled boats in Midlands Northwest. Again, I heard that yesterday from the people who were tallying. Um, but when, when votes are spoiled, uh, I've never or, seen or not fill, they're not filled in. It, do people write abusive comments or what's the normal, or is it just mistakes? The or odd one. Yeah. And, and, you know, there won't be that many abusive comments and you'll hear about the ones that are there, yeah. but you won't hear about the hundreds of blank papers. You know, there, there will be a proportion of people who will have gone to vote in there, because it, it's trouble, you go out to vote for local, but they'll look at yeah. the, the Europeans and they won't know who people are, especially when it's... I mean, there were 17 in Midlands Northwest. That's... I, I was looking at it myself. And, you know, so I can well understand how, how people will, you know, either leave it or just put down one or two or spoil the vote. I'm talking about... It's not a spoiled vote, but I spoke to the ladies about it before we came up here. The number of people who start at the top one, two, three, four, <laughs> is not negligible. And when you are looking for votes and the person is alphabetically ahead of you on the paper, you will notice them. And it's not inconsequential. So uh, at least people went out to vote. But I think that the numbers uh, running in the European Parliament election probably confused people. It is, and what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think people have different motivations. Um, a lot of people do go out to vote um, in the local elections for a candidate that they know, mm. and they'll go for that purpose, and then they're handed two or three other ballot papers, and they're not particularly interested in them. And I think, to Marion's point, especially when they're, they're two feet long and they may not know the candidates, um, there can be a, just a temptation to just throw it back in the ballot box without filling it out. Um, it's a it's a minority. Obviously, it's a small minority, but it, it's it's increasing. It would appear um, from election to election, um, and part of that is probably a bit of apathy. Um, you know, it was a very dull election campaign um, across the board. It only got exciting um, at ten o'clock on the late late show on Friday night. Frankly, when you know it looked like there was you know pretty pretty, you know, pretty big. Um, news about the Green Party which made it more exciting but uh, but it has been a very dull campaign at local and, and European election. I've been very very involved in all election campaigns since 2002, um, well since by-elections probably in 1999 and uh, this is I would say probably the most sort of you know un uninspiring, boring, <laughs> boring yeah. elections yes, okay. of Just all. <laughs> one of the reasons I've heard local councillors say mm -hmm. or, or give is that five years ago people were angry. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can, I think, even see that, yeah. and maybe yeah. that's accounting for the drop in the Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin definitely. So yeah. people are not as angry, yeah. and because of that, yeah. there's not as much interest. Oh. Yes. Just having me tallying at the weekend, there was an awful lot of Kylie spoils, so there was an awful lot of people who were numbering across two ballot sheets simultaneously. So there was an awful lot of people who, they were going up to 38 and 39 in terms of preferences. So they were doing one on this, ballot two on the next, three on the first, and they were going over and back. So half of those ballots, they don't have to work. We definitely spoiled. have a task to educate people, if that's the case. It's, it's, really it's, great, it's great to get insights like that from yeah. people who actually know. Yeah, that they've <laughs> so I'll just mention what my yes. colleague would say, Theresa Reedy from UCC. She's uh, lobbying for an electoral commission to actually educate oh, yeah. citizens and, okay. you know, Absolutely. like, yeah. yeah. So I, yes. I've done my pitch no. for her. No, and you're right. No, and she's right. <laughs> Absolutely. And whether we start in the schools or whatever, yeah. because maybe it's just some of us are just nerds and you have to be careful yeah. of that. You cannot expect that other people share your interests. It's back to your uh, argument about the bubble. We're in the bubble. You know, we yeah. know how to, to vote, but does yeah. everyone? Thanks, Joan. Um, so my two questions would be one: there you're, was. You're, 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 I know you're a public figure, but oh, I'm not. <laughs> Mark, Coleman Gordon did, Mark Coleman here, just as a member of and fan of the institute. Um, two brief questions. One is: Macron had a tremendous enthusiasm for the green agenda and implemented carbon taxes, <coughs> and the result was that large parts of France were paralysed uh, for successive months. So the first question is. The green wave of millennial enthusiasm is great and very heartwarming to see in terms of climate change, 
but um, is any politician going to be brave enough to uh, actually implement um, the taxation agenda? And then secondly, um, the parties on the centre-left and centre-right seem to be quite close to one another in the European Parliament. They seem to be a social democratic consensus around most issues. Is that a good thing? Uh, in that it's a bulwark against the extremes, or is it a bad thing in that it might drive people on the left and right to more more extreme uh, parties on the fringe? Well, on the carbon tax, um, I agree, and, and it goes back to the point that, in actual fact, the Greens achieve 5.6% of the vote over the weekend, <coughs> not, not, you know, 70%. Um, and I think a lot of people, I, I, for the first time in at least 10 years, gave a very high preference to to Kieran Cuff in the European elections because I think he's competent and because I think the Greens are going to be important in the European Parliament, etc. And I think a lot of people are sort of thinking along those lines. The Greens have been forgiven for the period in government with Fianna Fáil and the financial crisis, etc. And, you know, the economy is doing well. We're in a kind of a luxury position now to, mm. to sort of to embrace the green agenda. Does that mean that voters embrace carbon tax? I'm not convinced at all, at all, at all, at all. Um, and, and I'm also not convinced, by the way, um, as somebody who's genuinely concerned about climate change, etc., that a carbon tax is the solution. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a huge debate and there's so much academic uh, uh, conflict over that. Um, the Green Party in Ireland is in favour of um, a carbon tax, but that's not to say that everybody who supports um, a, a green agenda is in favour of carbon tax. So um, I, I, think, um, I think we have, have to wait and see. I would be personally much more enthusiastic about introducing water charges and people paying for the water that they use, but we saw how that ended up in 2004, so, um, and subsequently um, all of the main political parties ran a mile uh, because they couldn't cope with the controversy and failed to provide leadership, frankly. So I think we've a long way to go before we see carbon taxes in this country. Mm. The, the only comment I'll make there, and I'll let you go, when you mentioned water charges and carbon tax in the same breath, as it were, is if you go back to the introduction of water charges, the gentleman we spoke of earlier, <laughs> um, it was introduced in such a ham-fisted way Absolutely. that even those who felt water charges were, uh, you know, mm. an adequate way of, of raising taxation, uh, thought absolutely no. So if any government or political party is going to put forward an argument for a carbon tax, in my view, it needs to be very well researched and they need to be able to have supporting evidence. So, sorry, you go ahead. No, and this is a perfect transition for what I was going to say because Macron introduced, or kind of, yeah, introduced, let's say, the hiking carbon tax, like, just like that, like, you mm. know, I, I, on a country that has seen an increase in taxation over, what, two decades now. Uh, that is really fed up with um, uh, taxation hikes. Um, so it was very centralised, top down, um, no discussion with local authorities, no discussion with uh, trade unions, no discussion with citizens' um, yeah. associations, no discussion with anyone. You know, the Jupiter did his thing and that was that. So yes, then we had the yellow vest uh, crisis. But this is exactly what Marion is um, arguing for, uh, which can be translated at European level. I did think yesterday when I saw the green wave that Macron was like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> we can't go for ca carbon taxing. But um, what ha has happened in France then is the Grand Débat National, which is a very poor form of the fantastic citizens' assembly here. But I think we're mo in his um, latest uh, press conference, Macron has developed the idea of the 150 citizens assembly on um, environment so getting yeah. academics experts to talk to citizens and have this exchange as we've had in the citizens assembly and get it and get citizens in, uh, involved and this is what we started with by getting citizens associated at the european level with decision making and it's also what alberto alemano who's a professor in hsc argues for, and I think this is the only way forward for Europe. Like Technocracy is as lethal for the future of Europe as populism. Yeah. So we have to move away from this and associate European citizens. And if it's on uh, carbon tax, whether it's a good or a bad, but have this kind of citizens assembly or, you know, assembly of, yeah, citizens yeah, and just to contribute. Yeah. Yeah. A, a sentence on that, um, and we didn't answer your second question, at all about the centre-left, but 
Um, you know, I, I, I've often said when ministers talk about, um, you know, this project or that project, I said sometimes you get the impression they put their hand in their own pocket mm -hmm. and take out the money, and here I got this for you. Mm -hmm. And that the connection between the tax people pay and the, yeah. the services or projects, whatever, is, is never there. Mm -hmm. And I think with this one, I think the, the carbon tax, and I think it, it will come, yeah. um, if, if, if that's not embedded in the idea that it, this is a specific tax mm -hmm. to achieve particular outcomes uh, with the biggest challenge we face. In other words, it's not going into the black hole of an yeah. exchequer. Yeah. Um, and I think this, this could be a very interesting one. I think then there are, people may accept it, but it'll be a different way of dealing with it. Can I mention one thing? Yeah. Um, Yannick Jadot yesterday, who's the leader of the French Greens, um, now, my, I, I was watching the French television on my mobile phone and then it cut off because of geographical position. I'm dying for this thing called digital market to finally work. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, but he made his declaration and he's obviously one of the uh, victors, like uh, being third in the election. But he, he um, so I'm, I'm dying to hear more about it. He stated that he would put in place a citizens committee to review EU institutions policies and legisl legislation on with regards to environmental commitments and every month would actually give a press conference on MEP's performance. Now I'm dying to hear about this but it might participate uh, with the media coverage. You know, the more we cover what EU institutions are doing, like you were saying on social policy, on environmental policy, etc., the more we will educate again citizens and get them interested in EU issues. There is, and I agree, there is one small danger there. And again, looking at the Parliament in the last 12, 18 months, people started to take slightly more extreme positions, let's say within the left and within the right, within the EPP I'm talking about now, within the socials, because if, if something is, is media driven and every month looking at how MEPs are doing, that, that's very much media driven, um, it, 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 sometimes it doesn't allow MEPs to be reflective enough about what they're at, but you've got to, mm. you've got to get in there for this month, and next month, mm -hmm. and the month after. So everything has it's its It's a danger dangers. of politicising. Yeah. Okay, issues, we're, yeah. coming, we're coming towards the end. Um, don't want to go Hello, on. I'm a member of the Institute. Uh, Sir Ivor Rogers, who as you all know, uh, mentioned that the reaction or the response of the European institutions to Brexit was a mixture of complacency and strategic myopia. And frankly, listening to you, that's what I, I see. I mean, I suspect that the parties of the centre, uh, which everybody is very relaxed about, they're going to tack to the extremes. They've already started it. Um, uh, I mean, you can see it in the Christian Democrats, CSUs in, 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 uh, in Germany. Um, as regards the impact of, of um, uh, Europe on, on, on matters that affect people locally, I'm very surprised that people are worried about housing, but the tax base that the government is currently relying on, in other words, corporate taxation, is going to be eroded, whether we like it or like it not, despite everything that's said in the treaties, in one form or another by international agreements of which the EU is part of. And I'm going to come back to uh, basically the whole question of citizens' assemblies, which you're all in favor of, as far as I can see. Um, I'm not, I can mention. Okay, I'm well, okay, but anyway. Yeah. So the question is, Donald, what's the question? The question is, is how are you going, what mechanisms do we now need to ensure the mutual education of the democratic process, which is obviously missing, it was clearly missing in the water charges issue, okay. and it's missing on others. Anyone? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I think I think your your analysis is excellent. I, I just I, I agree with a lot of it, um, and the issue of, and Marion alluded to this a while ago, the fragmentation within the big political groups is clear. Um, so it's I mean we keep hearing about Hungary and the EPP, but actually. Um, there's a major problem with um, with the Social Democrats and their Romanian uh, friends, and Alde have some 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 
dubious um, members from, from other member states as well. So it's across the kind of the three, if you like, the three main m m centrist political groups. Um, and it hasn't been dealt with or tackled by the leaders because obviously everybody has an eye on the numbers and it is a numbers game in terms of not just the top th four or five positions within the institutions, but also in terms of the chairs of committees, the rapporteurs, the key positions on all of the committees. It really matters, um, ha you know, numbers matter. Um, and so they've turned a blind eye and there hasn't been a huge amount of leadership. I think, from my, from my point of view, so closer to home, the, 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 the first um, and most worrying example of that was in the UK. Um, where you know the rise of UKIP, rather than being challenged um, by effective leadership um, from moderates within the Conservative Party, um, was effectively instead <coughs> embraced, and uh, and and they decided to move their battle onto the, the the territory or the ground of UKIP. That was a big mistake, and that's what we're seeing happening in other member states as well, to some extent. The flip side of that, I suppose, is that Brexit has been a bit of a wake-up call. Um, in terms of sort of turning all of that around, well, I mean, politics, unfortunately, isn't going to change. It will always be a numbers game, and it's hard to see any simple solutions. I don't think there are any. Um, there, I mean, in terms of... Um, I don't believe in citizens' assemblies uh, at all, actually. I think that they're an excuse for governments to do nothing and for parliaments to do less um, and to abdicate responsibility and say, you know, the citizens' assembly recommended this, so I therefore don't have to take a position on it. So you end up with everybody just following a kind of a broad, um, um, inane consensus. And actually that plays a part in alienating a huge number of people who maybe don't agree with it. And instead of having their say and being represented in their national parliament, or in local government, regional government, or the European parliament, they end up not being represented by anybody at all. And in fact, their voice is completely shut down politically. And I, I personally suffered from that. Um, um, uh, not because of a citizen's assembly, but because of uh, how politicians were afraid to take a position on a controversial issue. Uh, and I lost my seat as a result of it, or at least partly as a result of it. Um, so there is no space now for, for people to have an alternative view. You either agree with the overwhelming consensus, um, and, uh, or, or you're, you're treated as a pariah. And I think that is a big factor in Eastern Europe. Um, where they have different concerns to those of us in Western Europe. They have concerns, um, broadly speaking, around security and defence, which are a huge issue, which don't even... I mean, we have this ridiculous, fictitious debate about a European army in this country. Meanwhile, you know, countries um, in, the, in the Baltic states um, and along the, the, the eastern border with Russia, and we have to remember that a European country was invaded by Russia and part of its territory annexed, not an EU member state, but a European country, only a few short years ago. And we didn't respond, and NATO didn't respond. These are the issues that are worrying um, those, those countries, along with you know, the, 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 sort of the, the attempt to shut down debate and the feeling that the European agenda is being driven um, by this drive for constant consensus, when in fact a healthy democracy allows for, for a variety of views um, within reason. Um, so I think that that is, I think we need political leadership, we need people to stand up um, for, for debate, for actual genuine healthy debate, allow differences of opinion, and yes, ultimately arrive at consensus. I mean, that, that is how you get business done um, at a political level. I mean, we heard a Green candidate uh, um, in this country uh, yesterday morning uh, quoted in the newspaper saying, uh, if I'm elected, I, you know, if, if my party joins with Fine Gael or Fianna Fáil, I'm going to leave the party. I mean, you're not even elected and you're leaving the party. Um, well, how else do you get, you know, how else do you advance your agenda? You have to compromise and you have to work together, for sure. Um, but, but taking, outsourcing po political decision making from Parliament to these randomly selected other elite groups who are not elected, to my mind, is crazy. Sorry. And then no, I'll no, give no, you the last no, word. No, sorry, don't read. Oh, okay. Well, I'll defend the Citizens' Assembly. So, um, no, I just think that, um, as we've pointed out, like, we live in a bubble. We're part of this elite or whatever. Um, citizens' Assembly or a mechanism along those lines allows for citizens to debate. I think there actually is a balance of views. They're randomly selected. Again, the random being different according to countries and etc. Uh, but they're randomly selected. There's an education process. And in terms of government kind of shirking and passing the book, 
like as far as I can see, I've been here 20 years and no Irish government were, went near the abortion issue like for years, like bef way before the citizens' assemblies. So the citizens' assembly, like, and, and even when I heard about the issue being put to a citizens' assembly, I was like, yeah, forget it. This is never going to happen. Um, and when they recommended not only like repealing the eighth, but going further, I was like, that, that's, that can't be right. But actually, that gives a pulse of what the country thinks and not the elite, not that bubble. Um, so the, the fact that citizens' assembly includes like expert, expert views that are debated, but there's a balanced debate happening, um, and there's a legitimacy coming from, I think, from those uh, randomly selected citizens. And we've seen it in Ireland, like the results is that the, referend the referenda have been passed really convincingly. You don't think so? On very sensitive issues. Okay. Uh, Marion, last word. Mention, Sorry, no, 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 we have to call it there. Okay. Uh, uh, Marion. Well, just to go back word. to the Citizens' Assembly there, for a start, I have to say, Manuel, I resent and have always resented being called the elite. Um, but you know you're seen like this by the people. Okay. Uh, I hope not, but that's another story. Okay. Um, but no, I do, and, and in any conversation I'm, I'm partaking in, if somebody refers to me as the elite, yeah. I will refuse to accept Likewise. that label. Um, but that's, that's uh, an important issue. Citizens' Assembly, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting on the fence here. I'm not, I can see how it has driven change in Ireland. That is absolutely the case. But equally, if government is going to outsource its decision making uh, on, on sensitive issues, uh, that's not good either. So um, while I, I believe in participative democracy, alongside representative yeah. democracy, yeah. because that's my background, yeah. participative democracy. I, I think we, we do need to be careful how we frame it. So I, I wouldn't be as negative as Lucinda is, though I can see that the negatives there are, and equally I mightn't be as positive as you are. Uh, you mentioned about Brexit and complacency. I think Brexit definitely has shook up the body politic to some extent. Because if we go back to, and people forget that the Dutch and the French voted against the Constitution Treaty. Uh, you know, for years all we heard was that Ireland voted against Nice and Lisbon. It was airbrushed very quickly out of history that the Dutch and the French did. And uh, they found ways around it. And of course, th that French vote was, I mentioned earlier, the posting of workers. That's what it was all about. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, you know, th that message never really got out and, and it's there. But to come back to the complacency question, yeah, I think that there, there was a lot of complacency. I think to some extent uh, there still is. Um, but I also think that um, when people look at the UK, it's a mixture of reasons as to why the majority, the small majority, voted to leave. And if we look at Salvini's rise in Italy, that's really to do with migration. And you know something? I believe if the level of migration was happening in Ireland under the same circumstances as in Italy, we'd be electing Salvini. The person who'd be topping the poll in Midlands Northwest might not be Mike McGuinness, but might be Peter Casey. So, you know, um, the, the complacency is when it doesn't touch you. And I think Europe has, has woken up to that a little bit. Um, but whether it's, it's sufficient or not, I can't say. Uh, but the thing about the UK is that there were, there were a number of reasons. And one of them, as we all know, was 30 years of uh, newspapers uh, you know, banging out a message. It was that, and then it was also the, the migration issue, and of course it was the sense that Britain is big enough uh, to be on its own, 
and succeed on its own. I think a lot of people just unfortunately um, missed the point that um, globalisation is a fact of life and for the British to feel they can go it alone successfully, of course they can go it alone, but successfully and to grow their economy is, is they, they think that the world is the same as it was 20 years ago and it's not. But is Europe too complacent in its response? Yes and no. Because I hear everybody talking about reforming Europe. But people have very different views about what that is. Um, you know, what's, what's reforming Europe? There are people who will say it's, it's social policy. But we can't go much further without change in the treaty, and that isn't going to happen. There are people who would say it's defence and security, you know. But again, is that in Western Europe, that doesn't matter as much as Eastern Europe. Sorry, I know you want me to finish, so I leave it at that. Thanks. No, it's, it's, no, uh, no. No, it's, it's, thank you very much. I think we, we have to leave it there because the contract is you have to get back to work. Absolutely. I know. Um, um, I just want to thank our, our three speakers this morning, Emmanuel, Lucinda and Marion, for, for coming and giving us of their expertise, you know. Um, I think it's very good to get insights into what's happening at this very interesting time. Yeah. So perhaps you'd show your appreciation of where we are.